right everyone welcome to live our live special on the Passover welcome to Air Church if you like this channel subscribe like the video share it on your social media pages and we will begin in just a moment So I hope that this will be a blessing to you. All right. So let's dig right in the Passover. Well, and I'll just fly through it this time. Okay. So what about the Passover? You might be wondering if you are a Christian or you are just never heard about it. Uh, you might be wondering, is this relevant to us today? So today we are going to look at some, some questions uh, that may interest especially us for us Christians right and I'm really predominantly making programs for Christians but if you are a seeker you are really welcome here you are welcome here and we hope that you if you have any questions you will uh, ask me uh, questions in the in the in the chat or in the comments later and I hope to be able to answer any of them well so what is Passover what is Passover the first question we're going to cover then we're going to talk a little bit about is it for Christians Right, because after all, we should know this, right? And then, did early Christians celebrate Passover? That's a good question too, I think. Uh, we'll look at some evidence for that, okay? And then, the final question will be, should Christians celebrate it today? And, well, let me, um, let me just uh, relieve your tension right here. I am not going to make you celebrate Passover, okay? Because that is not my purpose here. My purpose here is to actually... Uh, educate so that we understand this Passover and we understand how Jesus fits into the Passover and for us as Christians uh, what it actually means in daily living Christian living okay so I hope I hope you're you're not worried that I'll make you uh, celebrate Passover okay all of a sudden so what is Passover let's look into this first of all well it's one of the seven feasts of Israel so Israel had a religious calendar and it was revolving around feasts, feasts that were instituted by God. There were seven feasts on their calendar, and four of the uh, feasts were in the spring, and then three feasts were in the fall. And the first four, spring, four feasts in, the, in spring were Passover, of course, the unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. So you might be wondering, oh, I recognize these names from the New Testament. I was reading the New Testament and I saw these names. Very good. Well, why? Because all of these four feasts were already fulfilled by Jesus. He fulfilled them. He was our Passover. He was the fulfillment of the Passover. And that was, uh, according to the Jewish calendar, uh, on the... Uh, the Passover started on, on Nisan 14th. Nisan 14th was the name of the month. And then the very next day, Nisan 15th, was the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And Jesus is also our unleavened bread. Unleavened means there is no sin in him. Because leaven was a symbol of sin. So he is a unleavened bread broken for us, for our benefit. And we, uh, by what he has done, we can live, right? Just like bread sustains us. Jesus sustains us. And then, of course, first fruits is just three days later, and that is the day when Jesus rose from the dead. And it was exactly the same time when, um, uh, when the priests in the temple were, uh, were offering a first, first fruits of the new crop of barley 
to God in the temple. So just like Jesus rises to a new life and he gives us new life through faith, right? We rise to a new life with him. Uh, he was our first fruits. We, of course, we will follow with him into the resurrection. Uh, but it happened exactly at the same time. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament feast of first fruits. And then, of course, Pentecost comes seven weeks later. So it's seven times seven days plus the one extra day that is the 50th day. And that's the name of the feast, the Pentecost. Uh, and that is exactly when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit uh, and basically the church, as we know it, uh, you, you know, people filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's when the church was born actually, right? So isn't that interesting? All these four feasts were already fulfilled by Jesus during his first coming. Well, yes, as I mentioned, uh, Passover begins on, on Nisan 14th. It's the name of the month. It's the first month on the Jewish calendar. And just you need to understand that the Hebrew calendar was really um, it was not like our modern cal calendar. Uh, we we look we can calculate exactly how uh, how many days it takes for the sun to go around. Sorry, the Earth go around the sun, and then we divide it into equal numbers, and so on and so on. But the Jewish cal calendar or the Hebrew calendar is based on the idea of the movement of both the sun, or actually the Earth around the sun, and the moon. So we call it the lunisolar calendar. And what this means, well, basically, it's where does it come from? Well, it comes from the idea that in Genesis 1, 14, God says that he, that's the reason why he created the sun and the moon, so that they are our calendar in the sky, right? They are meant to divide the days and the seasons, the various feasts, uh, and so on. So this is why the Hebrew calendar... Uh, does rely on the movement of the moon just as well as it does on the movement of the sun. So you can imagine 14th is exactly half of 28th. The lunar cycle is 28 days. So just as Jesus was sitting with his disciples during the Last Supper, celebrating the Passover, which actually celebrating himself as the fulfillment of the Passover, he, this was, you know, the middle of the month, so which means that probably it was a night of the full moon. Isn't it interesting? People can look up in the sky and right away, without any technology, they were able to, to say, okay, well, this is the beginning of the month, this is the middle of the month, and this is the end of the month. So yes, the night of the full moon is when pass Passover begins. And the content of the Passover, what is it? Well... It's all about remembering God's deliverance from slavery through the shed blood of the Lamb, right? If you remember, uh, the, the, the episode is described in, in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, especially in Exodus 12 is the, the part I'm referring to. And what happened was that after the series of plagues, uh, you know, Pharaoh didn't want to let Israel go, but God judged all the Egyptian gods one after another. And then the, there was this, uh, Moses basically was told that the, the angel would pass over Egypt and, and what the Israelites needed to do, they needed to sacrifice a lamb to, to cover the doorposts of their houses with that, lamb, with that blood of the lamb. And that means the, as the angel was passing and judging Egypt, uh, the angel would look at each household and where the blood was already spilled, that household would be spared and the angel would go on to the next household and so on and so on. And of course, that night, um, the firstborn of every, every household uh, died because of the judgment of the angel passing over Egypt. And of course, uh, that led to the Pharaoh finally uh, releasing Israel from bondage. And of course, you can see so many parallels, right? Because this... We are also, because of the blood of the Lamb, uh, Jesus is, our, is our, the Lamb of God, just like John pointed to Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is our Passover Lamb, and it is because of His shed blood that we are free from sin and death. So the parallel, or actually the fulfillment, is much greater in scope than the original feast. 
So guys, you probably know this guy, you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, it was made in 1956. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about the events in this movie. So even if you haven't read the Bible, uh, you might want to read, uh, watch this movie, uh, because it was pretty epic. I don't recommend it as, uh, you know, as a substitute for the Bible, not at all. In fact, it was inaccurate in many, many ways. But if you want, check out the movie Ten Commandments and then compare it to Exodus. And that would be an interesting project, wouldn't it? Okay, the next question I'm going to answer today is, is Passover for Christians? Is it for Christians or not? Yes, well, yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Ah, uh, you probably wanted an easy answer. Well, I will say in what way it is not, and then I will answer what, in what way it can still apply, okay? And the answer really means on what you mean, okay? It's, you know, always, it's in the details that, that knowledge really is found, okay? We have to scratch beneath the surface. People tend to, tend to think in this black and white categories. You're either with me or you're against me. I, I love you. I hate you. I, you know, I agree with you. I disagree with you. No, no, no. I hope that you don't do that today. Instead, allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate you and, um, and then, um, uh, and then we, you have a proper understanding of what, what Passover is for us. Because, first of all, let's just establish the rules here. Uh, if we go to Colossians chapter 2, Paul is clearly writing the following. Okay, listen to this carefully. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. Okay, there's no passing judgment. There are on, these are only a shadow. They are a shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. So if I stick out my hand in front of me, you know, I can see a shadow on my desk. Yes, but the shadow is not the real hand, right? The real hand is Christ, where the shadow was just pointing to the real thing. And so, so we could say, no, I guess it's not for Christians, right? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of, of, our, of the Passover. Similarly, in Romans 14, um, Paul is saying the following. No one man and esteems one day as better than another, while another man esteems all days alike. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. Uh-huh, yes. So you are to make up your mind, right? But he says, he who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. He also who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So notice, seems, it seems like people have different reasons for doing things, uh, but there is, remember that previous passage, there should be no judgment passed, okay, no judgment passed. So, how, first of all, let's look at how the Passover does not apply to a Christian. In what way does it, in what aspect does it not apply, okay? First of all, the Passover is a, a part of the requirement of the Mosaic law. So every able Jewish person living in Israel during the time of Jesus was required to go down to Jerusalem and celebrate uh, the Passover. Well, of course, this is not, cannot apply to Christians. Not only that. There's no temple, there's no Levites, so there's no sacrifice, so you, there's not, no lamb to offer, right? Because when Jesus is our this fulfillment of that. So it seems like God took, not only we read in Hebrews that he actually literally took the Mosaic law and he rendered it obsolete because there is a new covenant in force right now, in effect, and the old covenant does no longer apply. All right, so no, no temple, no Levites, and no sacrifice. And there is to be no passing judgment. So if one Christian wants to do this, and he wants to do it, well, then he cannot pass judgment onto another Christian who chooses not to do this, okay? Do you see what I mean? On the other hand, the one who is not doing it, who is not celebrating the Passover, and let's say he is enjoying his freedom in Christ, knowing that it's only through faith that he's satisfied, that nothing... There's nothing that he can do to love, to make God love him more or love him less because he's fully accepted in Christ. That person can also not pass judgment on the one who is observing Passover. Do you see what I mean? 
So there's no passing judgment in either direction. And we need to be very careful, especially because there are some cults out there that will try to enslave you. They will try to enslave you and try to pull you back into the yoke of the Mosaic law. Okay, and they will say, well, you're not a fully a Christian because you don't do this, you don't do that. And, you know, it usually starts with the Sabbath, then it goes to, no, the Bible is very clear. All of these things. Actually, Christianity is one of those, it's, well, it's really not one of those. It's a unique, unique religion in the world where our faith is not dependent on anything we do. It is only dependent on what Christ has done for us on our behalf. So we could give up all of our traditions. We could give up everything that we do that would, you, would be termed as Christian. And we would still be children of God. We would be saved. And there is nothing there that, would, that would, can affect our salvation in Jesus. Isn't it cool? I think that's really, really cool. And I think we need to remember this as Christians because... Over the years, Christians have made these camps, right? And these Christians do something this way, and these Christians do something that way. And then they all have good reasons for doing that. What happens when they gather, they start arguing, and they start, they start you know, um, bickering over these things. And here, Paul is clearly telling you that, so what? One is uh, esteeming one day more as more holy than the other, and the other one esteems both all days alike, that's fine. This one does it to the Lord and this one does it to the Lord. It's none of your business to pass judgment on to a brother or sister, right? So we really have that freedom. We are above that and none of that can affect our walk with God. Uh, so, so, you know, rest assured that your faith is safe and all, is, all that is needed is, is faith. So beware of cults because they will try to point to Old Testament scripture and they will try to use it in, not in order to teach you more about Jesus, but in order to, uh, to, to put you under the yoke of the, of the sort of pseudo mosaic law, not really mosaic law because that is impossible. There is no temple. So, uh, so it would be like, you know, picking, choosing and picking clauses from the contract and saying, you see, this still applies, that still applies. No don't have nothing to do with that okay you are free in christ so how does how but how does passover can apply how can it apply for a christian in what way in what aspect well it is useful for our understanding of the roots of our faith where did our faith come from okay of course it came from the faith of abraham right faith of abraham and we read in new testament oftentimes our faith is compared to the faith of abraham so, but also we see that G Jesus not only celebrated Passover, but also he pointed it to, pointed to himself as its fulfillment. I am not saying that the fact that Jesus celebrated Passover is the reason why we should celebrate the Passover. No, that is not a good reason because Jesus was, a, he was living as a, in, uh, as a human, you know, he was God, but in his human uh, nature, he lived as a, law observant Jew and celebrating Passover was a requirement. So that is not a good reason for us to do that. However, during the Passover Seder, Jesus pointed to himself as the fulfillment of the Passover. So actually, when you, if you have ever experienced the, the Jewish Passover Seder, it, it is very elaborate and there's, there are various dishes symbolizing different things. And some of them symbolize uh, uh, the hardship that Israel um, has undergone in the desert and so on and so on. I mean, we could go into these details, but on another level, what is very interesting is that every single element of this Passover points to Jesus. Okay? Everything, starting from, remember, the triumphant entry when Jesus enters Jerusalem and uh, the crowds are cheering and they're singing the messianic psalm. Um, and, and, and Jesus is entering Jerusalem as, you know, uh, he's acclaimed to be the Messiah by the people waving palm branches. Well, at the very same time in the temple, the Passover lambs were being inspected for the sacrifice. They were checking, checking the lambs if they have any blemish or not, right? Isn't it interesting? The Lamb of God enters Jerusalem at the same time as the Passover lambs are being inspected for the sacrifice. 
But there's a there's an interesting during the Passover seder uh, there is this um, there is this special bread that is used. It's unleavened bread. It's called the matzah or matzos. Uh, basically, it's flat, and it's sort of like the pita bread, you know, that you can buy in 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 markets today. It just has no 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 uh, yeast in it, and one of them is a special one and they call it the afikoman it's the only greek word in the entire uh, celebration uh and the word means the one that came or the one that he was who was supposed to come all right very interesting and that bread is broken then it's wrapped and it's hidden early in the in the in the passover seder and then later on it is found it is you know children look for it and they are really rejoicing when they find it. This is really, isn't it interesting? It parallels the fact that Jesus was broken for us, for our sins. Then he was hidden in the grave for three days, and then he was risen again, and then that's when the rejoicing began. Very, very interesting. So we could spend hours on this, but today, let's not. Let's just, um, uh, that's a separate study, but let's look at, especially at these two elements that Jesus highlighted during the Passover Seder the bread and the wine okay and of course you know it as a christian you know it as uh, some people refer to it as the eucharist right the elements that we sometimes uh, eat um, re receive remembering what jesus did for us so these are symbolic of his broken body and his shed blood for our benefit and he also ordained ordained it uh its remembrance right he says uh uh as much as you take of it or you know as many times as you partake of it remember right so so you know in that way well obviously um the passover applies because that's exactly when it was instituted on the 14th day of nisan of the month right very very interesting isn't it well there are additional benefits of getting you know studying the passover for a christian first of all we can understand our faith better because our faith really is a natural extension, natural development of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and also of Moses. All of those uh, patriarchs and men and the prophets, they were all looking forward to Jesus, to his coming and to the ushering in of the new covenant. So we must understand that, right? Because it is not as if Christianity suddenly was uh, kind of, uh, you know, made up or something like that. It has very real historical roots and very old roots. So, and another aspect I think that helps us with the understanding of the Passover is that we know that God had a plan of saving us from the very beginning. This is not like a haphazard decision uh, that God says, oh, well, how should I save them? Oh, I'll send Jesus. No, everything has been planned and even the the illustration of of israel being saved from slavery through the blood of the lamb is a picture of god's plan of saving the whole world through um the blood of the lamb of god right which he himself provided amazing amazing stuff that really strengthens our faith as we ponder these things and just imagine just as it was true that god's method of saving israel was 100% sufficient, okay? With whoever, whichever household painted the blood on the doorposts of their house was saved, right? And they all left Egypt. It was 100% sufficient, even though it may sound a strange method. And yet whoever trusted Moses's, Moses's message, whatever Moses told the people, they just followed it. They did it, you know, and those people were saved. Faith was all that was required, right? Trust, trusting in Moses' message was what was required to be saved from Egypt. And in the same way, trusting in Jesus' message is everything that is needed to be saved from sin and death. Still true, guys. Nothing has changed, right? Isn't it amazing? I think it's very encouraging to know this. And by the way, you know, just imagine Egypt. There probably were some Jewish, some Hebrews who would not believe Moses. They might say, this man is crazy. I'm not doing anything like that. Superstition, you know, what, who does he think he is, you know? And if they didn't do it, then the firstborn would have died in that household. On the other hand, just imagine the 10 plagues that took over Egypt. 
probably there were some Egyptians that were going like, whoa, our gods are being judged. And this Moses dude here, maybe his God is real. And now he's saying something to his people about the blood of the lamb and stuff like that. Maybe we should do the same thing. And I wouldn't be surprised that among those who left um, Egypt that day were some Egyptian families that actually believed and trusted in the God of Moses and they did the same thing, right? Isn't it interesting? I think it is interesting to ponder that. Well, another question. Did early Christians celebrate the Passover? Did they celebrate the Passover? Well, <laughs> the most obvious answer is that yes, because first Christians were predominantly Jewish, right? They were predominantly Jewish, so they would be celebrating the Passover. That is their, you know, they would just be doing it uh, naturally on the same day as always, just with a different understanding of what it means, right? So they would, during the Passover meal, they would say, well, Jesus, during the third cup, because the Passover meal has four cups in there, right? And the third cup is the, is the one that Jesus said, you know, this is my blood. And this Afikoman, he, this was the bread that he broke. He says, this is my body broken for you. So, so they would understand, have a new understanding, but they would celebrate it just the same uh, with a new understanding of what it means as, as it was fulfilled in Christ. Yes, of course, that's what, that's, that was very natural. And we know that the Apostle this did it, the uh, Apostle John did that. And of course, this continued, uh, this, this tradition continued. However, in, in, in years after that, in the second century and so on, there started, once Christianity sort of became mainstream, it was widely accepted, you know, by Constantine and so on, there was this growing anti-Semitism in mainstream Christianity. And there was this uh, kind of a, a trend to cut yourself off from, from the Jewish roots, okay? And that was growing and growing strongly and strongly. This is very unfortunate because, you know, I think, why not? I think we should live in peace and harmony and understand how Jesus fits into the Jewish uh, understanding of the faith. And instead, there was this strong push to cut yourself off from anything that is of, you know, of, has to do with, with Jews. Um, yes, that, that was very un unfortunate. And finally, one thing led to another and there was this a uh, controversy which kind of uh, blew up and it was called the Quarto Deciman controversy. It's a fancy name, but you can see Quarto Deciman stands for number 14, right? These were the people, the, um, the Christians, who were celebrating the Passover on the 14th of Nisan according to the lunisolar calendar. However, you know, there was, as I mentioned, there was this, the, the fight was going on and I think the majority uh, said that, you know, uh, this, as I mentioned, with the feeling of anti-Semitism and so on, the, the idea came up that, well, since Jesus, the emphasis is on the fact that Jesus rose on Sunday, so let's just attach the celebration of his resurrection to a Sunday, because Passover is, you know, we don't know what day of the week it is, right? But we know that Jesus rose on Sunday. So the church decided, you know, okay, let's forget about these guys that are quarto decimans, you know, they are old fashioned, they are celebrating uh, Passover on the wrong date. And basically the church decided to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ at a different date. Okay. And basically that's what we have today. We have two dates on the calendar. They very rarely come even close to one another. Uh, however, you know, the Passover, the moon is still out there. And the question I guess remains, <laughs> does, ga does God really care or pay attention to our calendar or to his calendar? I don't know. That's a different question for another meeting. And I'm not saying that we should be doing it, but I'm just saying it that, you know, you should have a common, a proper understanding of how it came to be. All right. How it came to be that, that now we are celebrating Easter and it's not, not on the date of uh, the Passover and of the first fruits resurrection from the dead. Okay. I hope that that much is clear. So how, how did early Christians uh, understand the Passover? Okay, how, how did early Christians understand the Passover? Well, first of all, we realized from reading some sources that they had excellent understanding of it. Okay, very, very good understanding, probably much better understanding 
than an average Christian has today, okay? They have very good understanding of what Passover means and how Jesus is its fulfillment. And to illustrate this, we're going to read um, a second century homily. Homily is like a kind of teaching uh, by one of the fa fathers of the church, Melito of Sardis. Sardis. He, was, uh, um, he lived in second century. Um, legend has it that he was a, a student of, uh, of John, John the Apostle. And um, uh, he also knew the Polycarp and, uh, you know, famous people like that. He wrote many things. However, most of his writings were lost. So uh, I hope that by reading this uh, homily together, you will understand how Christians understood. And we know that Passover is just coming up. I think uh, from the day of this broadcast is just two days apart. On the calendar, you can check uh, if in case you're watching it at a different date, check on the calendar when is Passover. And normally Christians would gather and they would celebrate the Passover. And now let's travel in time. Let's take a time machine, go back to the uh, middle of second century or the first, the first half of the uh, second century and read the homily that Melito wrote to Christians. I hope that you will be um, uh, you will be blessed through this. Okay, and by the way, all these links are linked under the video. You can read it for yourself. Uh, but I I find it to be mind blowing, uh, and I hope that you will also find it to be a great blessing. Okay, let's start reading. First of all, the scripture about the Hebrew Exodus has been read, and the words of the mystery have been explained as to how the sheep was sacrificed and the people were saved. The word mystery, uh, and let me just stop. I will, I will be reading and commenting, okay? The word mystery doesn't mean something that we don't know. But in Greek, the word mysterion means that something wasn't known, but now it is revealed. Now it no, we know what we didn't know before, basically. That's the idea. So the people were saved because of the sheep, right? The, the, the lamb was, uh, was slaughtered, and that's how people were saved. Therefore, understand this, O beloved. The mystery of the Passover is new and old, eternal and temporal, corruptible and incorruptible, mortal and immortal, in this fashion. It is old in, as, in so far as it concerns the law, right? The Old Testament. But new in so far as it concerns the gospel. Temporal in so far as it concerns the type. Eternal because of grace. Corruptible because of the sacrifice of the sheep which means, you know, they had to do it year after year, okay? Incorruptible because of the life of the Lord. He lives forever. He doesn't die any, ever again. Mortal because of his burial in the earth. Immortal because of his resurrection from the dead. Yes. The law is old, but the gospel is new. The type was for time, but grace is forever. The sheep was corruptible, but the Lord is incorruptible. Who was crushed as a lamb, but who was resurrected as God. For although he was led to sacrifice as a sheep, yet he was not a sheep. And although he was a lamb without voice, yet indeed he was not a lamb. The one who was the model, the other was found to be the finished product. Amazing. Look at the eloquence of this, of, of this, uh, of this Melito of Sardis. It's amazing, right? For God replaced the lamb and the man the sheep, but in the man was Christ, who contains all things. Hence the sacrifice of the sheep, and the sending of the lamb to slaughter, and the writing of the law, each led to and issued in Christ, for whose sake everything happened in the ancient law, and even more so in the new gospel. For indeed the law issued in the gospel, the old in the new, both coming forth together from Zion and Jerusalem and the commandment issued in grace, and the type in the finished product, and the lamb in the sun, and the sheep in a man, and the man in God. Wow! Just amazing. Try to unpack that, yeah? It's amazing. For the one who was born as son, and led to slaughter as a lamb, and sacrificed as a sheep, and buried as a man, rose up from the dead as God, since he is by nature both God and man. He is everything. Oh, by the way, let's stop here. Look how deep the understanding of the early Christians about Jesus being God is, right? We're going right to the very beginning of Christianity here. And 
you know, some people say, you know, the idea that Jesus was God was added later, you know, it evolved. Nonsense. It's rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish. <laughs> he is everything. In that he judges, he is law. In that he teaches, he is gospel. In that he saves, he is grace. In that he begets, he is father. In that he is begotten, he is son. In that he suffers, he is sheep. In that he is buried, he is man. In that he comes to life again, he is God. Such is Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Amazing, right? So he says, now comes the mystery of the Passover, even <clears throat> as it stands written in the law, just as it had been read along only moments ago. So probably before the meeting they read from Exodus, right? <clears throat> But it will clearly set forth the significance of the words of the scripture, showing how God commanded Moses in Egypt when he had made his decision to bind Pharaoh under the lash, but to release Israel from the lash through the hand of Moses. Think about the parallels here, okay? For see to it, he says, that you take a flawless and perfect lamb and that you sacrifice it in the evening with the sons of Israel and that you eat it at night and in haste. You are not to break any of its bones, right? Jesus' bones on the cross were not broken. Another fulfillment of the prophecy. You will do it like this, he says. In a single night, you will eat it by families and by tribes, your loins girded and your staves in your hands. For this is the Lord's Passover, an eternal reminder for the sons of Israel. Why were they girded? Why were they girded? They had like a belt, a sash and a staff in their hand. Because they knew that they were leaving Egypt, that this doing this would set them free. So they were just packing their things and they were ready to leave. Okay, And that's the point he's making. And just like for us, we are not of this world. We know that Jesus set us free and he has seated us in the heavenly realms together with him. And that's where we belong, really. So we shouldn't live our lives very thinking that you know we'll be here for a long time. We should be girded and ready to go at any moment. Excellent. Then take the blood of the sheep and anoint the front door of your houses by placing upon the post of your entranceway the sign of the blood in order to ward off the angel. For behold, I will strike Egypt and in a single night she will be made childless from beast to man. Then when Moses sacrificed the sheep and completed the mystery at night together with the sons of Israel, he sealed the doors of their houses in order to protect the people and to ward off the angel. Isn't that interesting? You are protected by Jesus. His blood protects you so that even if you want to wander off, the door is sealed. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You can't lose his protection. Very interesting. Let's see what happens to Egypt. But when the sheep was sacrificed and the Passover consumed and the mystery completed and the people made glad and Israel sealed, then the angel arrived to strike Egypt, who was neither initiated into the mystery, participant of the Passover, sealed by the blood, nor protected by the spirit, but who was the enemy and the unbeliever. In a single night, the angel struck and made Egypt childless. For when the angel had encompassed Israel and had seen her sealed with the blood of the sheep, he advanced against Egypt and by means of grief subdued the stubborn Pharaoh, clothing him not with a cloak of mourning, nor with a torn mantle, but with all of Egypt torn and mourning for the firstborn. Just imagine all these Egyptians running to the Pharaoh's palace the next morning, wailing, you know, and saying, Pharaoh, these you need to let them go because these people, you know, look what they've done to us. For all Egypt plunged in troubles and calamities. And by the way, in the household of Pharaoh, his firstborn also died. So Pharaoh would be having ashes on his face instead of his beautiful makeup as usual, as the Egyptians loved it. And he would be dressed in a sock cloth, a sackcloth, right? For all Egypt plunged in troubles and calamities, in tears and lamentations, came to Pharaoh in utter sadness, not in appearance only, but also in soul, having torn not only their garments, but their, her tender breasts as well. So incredible grief, right? Indeed, it was possible to observe an extraordinary sight. In one place, people beating their breasts, in another, those wailing, 
and in the middle of them Pharaoh, mourning, sitting in sackcloth and cinders, ashes, shrouded in thick darkness as in a funeral garment, girded with all Egypt as with a tunic of grief. Beautiful writing, so eloquent. For Egypt clothed Pharaoh as a cloak of wailing. Such was the mantle that had been woven for, this, for his royal body. With just such a cloak did the angel of righteousness clothe the self-willed Pharaoh with bitter mournfulness and with thick darkness and with childlessness. For that angel warred against the firstborn of Egypt. Indeed, swift and insatiate was the death of the firstborn and an unusual monument of defeat set up over those who had fallen dead in a moment could be seen, for the defeat of those who lay dead became the provisions of death. If you listen to the narrations of this extraordinary event, you will be astonished, for these things befell the Egyptians, a long night and a darkness which was touchable, and death which touched, and an angel who oppressed, and Hades which devoured their firstborn. Notice there's this darkness. Also, there was darkness, uh, you know, prior to Jesus passing on the cross, right? Very interesting. S supernatural darkness. But you must listen to something still more extraordinary and terrifying. In the darkness which could be touched was hidden death which could not be touched. And the ill-starred Egyptians touched the darkness, while death on the watch touched the firstborn of the Egyptians, as the angel had commanded. Therefore, if anyone touched the darkness, he was led out by death. Indeed, one firstborn touching a dark body with his hand, and utterly frightened in his soul, cried aloud in misery and in terror, What has my right hand laid hold of? At what does my soul tremble? What cloaks my whole body with darkness? If you are my father, help me. If my mother, feel sympathy for me. If my brother, speak to me. If my friend, sit with me. If my enemy go away from me, since I am a firstborn son. So basically, he's, you know, he's alluding here to the fact that the judgment of God, there's nothing, nothing can save you from it, right? Because not your father, not your mother, not your connections, it doesn't matter. The judgment of God is impartial. So the firstborn died as a result. There was nothing that can be done about it without the covering of the blood. And therefore, the first, and before the firstborn was silent, the long silence held him in its power, saying, You are mine, O firstborn. I, the silence of death, am your destiny. And another firstborn, taking note of the capture of the firstborn, denied his identity. So he tried to lie to the darkness, so that he might not die a bitter death. I am not a firstborn son. I was born a third child. But he who could not be deceived touched that firstborn, and he fell forward in silence. In a single moment, the firstborn fruit of the Egyptians was destroyed. The one first conceived, the one firstborn, the one sought after, the one chosen was dashed to the ground. Not only that of men, but that of irrational animals as well. <clears throat> a lowing was heard in the fields of the earth of the cattle bellowing for their nurslings, a cow standing over her calf and a mare over her colt and the rest of the cattle, having just given birth to their offspring and swollen with milk, were lamenting bitterly and pit piteously, piteously for their firstborn, with pity, basically. And there was a wailing and lamentation because of the destruction of the men, because of the destruction of the firstborn, who were dead. And all Egypt stank because of the unburied bodies. Well, you can imagine, it took many days to, to bury all the dead, so it must have been incredible stench. Indeed, one could see a frightful spectacle of the Egyptians. There were mothers with disheveled hair and fathers who had lost their minds, wailing aloud in terrifying fashion in the Egyptian tongue. O oh, wretched persons that we are, we have lost our firstborn in a single moment. And they were striking their breasts with their hands, beating time in hammer-like fashion to the dance of their dead. Such was the misfortune which encompassed Egypt. In an instant, it made her childless. But Israel all the while was being protected by the sacrifice of the sheep, by truly and truly was being illumined by the blood which was shed, for the death of the sheep was found to be rampart for the people. A defense, right? A rampart for the people. 
O oh, inexpressible mystery, the sacrifice of the sheep was found to be the salvation of the people, and the death of the sheep became the life of the people, for its blood warded off the angel. Tell me, O oh angel, at what were you turned away, at the sacrifice of the sheep or the life of the Lord, at the death of the sheep or the type of the Lord, at the blood of the sheep or, by the, or the spirit of the Lord? Clearly you were turned away. So basically what, uh, what Melito here is saying is he's saying that, you know, this was just the blood of an animal. It couldn't do anything. But because it was a type of what Jesus did on the cross in the future, that is the reason why the angel turned away and, and, you know, and Israel was saved. Okay, So prophetically speaking to the future event, this blood of the lamb worked uh, at that time, okay, which is very, very interesting way of looking at it. Because you saw the mystery of the Lord taking place in the sheep, the life of the Lord in the sacrifice of the sheep, the type of the Lord in the death of the sheep, for this reason you did not strike Israel. See exactly what, what he's saying. But it was Egypt alone that you made childless. And of course, Egypt is, the, is a symbol of this world, right, under the rulership of Satan himself who's typified by Pharaoh. So, you know, Pharaoh is obviously uh, um, saddened by the turn of events and, and, you know, the world is judged. What was this extraordinary mystery? It was, uh, it was Egypt struck to destruction, but Israel kept for salvation. Listen to the meaning of this mystery. Beloved, no speech or event takes place without a pattern or design. Every event and speech involves a pattern that which is spoken, a pattern, and that which happens, a prefiguration, in order that the event is disclosed through the prefiguration, so also the speech may be brought to expression through its outline. It's just a fancy way of saying that before we build something, we make a plan. You know, before we build a house, we draw up a blueprint. Before we build a car, we have to make a prototype to see how it's going to work. And this is what um, Melito is talking about. Without the model, no work of art arises. Is not that which is to come into existence seen through the model which typifies it? Yes. For this reason, a pattern of that which is to be made, either out of wax or out of clay or out of wood, in order that by the smallness of the model destined to be destroyed, might be seen that thing which is to arise from it, higher than it in size, and mightier than it in power, and more beautiful than it in appearance, and more elaborate than it in ornamentation. So of course, if an architect designs a house, they will make a little 3D model to see what it, how it works and everything, but the model is not the main thing. The house that they're building is the main thing, and the same thing with the Passover uh, having its fulfillment in Jesus. So whenever the thing arises for which the model was made, then that which carried the image of that future thing is destroyed as no longer of use, since it has transmitted its resemblance to that which is by nature true. Therefore, that which once was valuable is now without value, because that which is truly valuable has appeared. Jesus has appeared. He is the real thing. For each thing has its own time. There is a distinct time for the type, for the model, for the prototype, and there's a distinct time for the material, and there's a distinct time for the truth. You construct the model. You want this because you see it in it, the image of the future work. You procure the material for the model. You want this on account of that which is going to arise because of it. You complete the work and cherish it alone, for only in it do you see the both type and the truth. See what he's saying? By understanding how Passover is fulfilled uh, in Jesus, we, well, the actual Passover is without value, and yet its value is that we can appreciate it, right? By looking back at it now. So even Melito, who was of Jewish origin, he's not saying you must observe Passover, but understand its meaning. So therefore, if it was like this with models of perishable objects, so indeed will it also be with those of imperishable objects. If it was like this with earthly things, so indeed also with it, it be with heavenly things. For even the Lord's salvation and his truth were prefigured in the people, 
and the teaching of the gospel was proclaimed in advance by the law. The people therefore became the model of the church and the law a parabolic sketch. But the gospel became the explanation of the law and its fulfillment, while the church became the storehouse of truth. And by the way, the church here, we're not talking about organization. The word, the Greek word here is ecclesia. Ecclesia means you and I, those called out once, those that were called out of the world. Just like Israel was left the world, the Egypt, right? You and I, by faith in Christ, we are the church, right? Therefore, the type had value prior to its realization, and the parable was wonderful prior to its interpretation. This is to say that the people had value before the church came on the scene, and the law was wonderful before the gospel was brought to light. But when the church came on the scene, and the gospel was set forth, the type lost its value by surrendering its significance to the truth. And the law was fulfilled by surrendering its significance to the gospel. Just as the type lost its significance by surrendering its image to that which is true by nature. And as the parable lost its significance by being illumined through the interpretation. And, you know, that's true. The parable, the parables that Jesus was uh, teaching us, you know, the parable of the sower. It's not about the sower, right? We don't care about the sower. It's the truth that is behind the parable that we care about. That the seed falls, the word of God falls on different types of people. And in some cases, it, it brings forth a great harvest. And in some cases, it just dies. So, you know, the parable is, is just a tool that is pointing to the real truth. And that truth is timeless. It's, that's the real thing. So indeed, also the law was fulfilled when the gospel was brought to light. And the people lost their significance when the church came on the scene, the people uh, means, you know, um, the ways of doing things that the people used to do, okay? The church means those who are, uh, you know, born of the Spirit. Uh, this is what is significant. This is what lasts. Uh, and the type was destroyed when the Lord appeared. Therefore, those things which once had value are today without value because the things which have true value have appeared. For at one time, the sacrifice to the sheep was valuable, but now it is without value because of the life of the Lord. The death of the sheep once was valuable, but now it is without value because of the salvation of the Lord. The blood of the sheep once was valuable, but now it is without value because of the Spirit of the Lord. Right? So there's no need for any further sacrifices. The silent lamb once was valuable, but now it has no value because of the blameless son. The temple here below, the one made of stone, was once valuable, but now it is without value because of the Christ from above. And by the way, under the new covenant, who is the temple of the Lord? You and I, those filled with God's spirit. We are the temple of God on earth. The Jerusalem here below once had value, but now it is without value because of the Jerusalem from above. The meager inheritance, the earthly inheritance, right, the land that Abraham was promised, had value. Now it is without value because of the abundant grace. For not uh, in one place alone, not yet in the narrow confines, has the glory of God been established, but in His grace has been poured out upon the uttermost parts of the inhabited world. And there are the Almighty God has taken up his dwelling place through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. So what, amen. So what Meliton, Melito is saying, he is saying that, um, you know, the, the religious activities in the, under the old covenant all circled around the stone temple in Jerusalem. But now, you are probably watching this from whatever country, from the ends of the world, and your spirit, Holy Spirit dwells within you, and this is what he means. He poured out his grace to the uttermost uh, of the world, and you are a part of that. This is amazing stuff, guys. Amazing, amazing stuff. Now that you have heard the explanation of the type, type of the Passover, and, that of, and of that which corresponds to it, hear also what goes into making up the mystery. What is the Passover? Indeed, its name is derived from that event, to celebrate the Passover. Pass Shane in 
in, in derived from to suffer. Therefore, learn who the sufferer is. Who is the sufferer? And who is he who suffers along with the sufferer? Why indeed was the Lord present upon the earth? Why did Jesus have to come on the earth? Well, in order that having clothed himself with the one who suffers, he takes on humanity, he might lift him up to the heights of heaven. He might lift humanity up to heaven. In the beginning, when God made heaven and the earth and everything in them through his word, he himself formed man from the earth and shared with that form his own breath, right? Breath, the same word uh, for the spirit. He himself placed him in paradise, which was eastward in Eden, and there they lived most luxuriously. Then, by way of command, God gave them this law, for your food you may eat from any tree, but you are not to eat from the tree of the one who knows good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you most certainly will die. Wow. Okay. So God reserved one tree. And that was basically, uh, you know, his way of establishing himself as the creator over the creation. Right? It's sort of like if you were working in a company and the boss is giving you everything, says, okay, everything in this office here is at your disposal. I trust you with everything. However, you know, in this drawer here, there are personnel files there and there are things that I don't want you to touch, okay? And the boss leaves. Well, if you open up those files and the boss catches you, don't be surprised that you get fired, okay? Because you have become proven you have proven yourself to be unsubordinate you have challenged his authority but man who is by nature capable of receiving good and evil as soil of the earth is capable of receiving seeds from both sides see adam was in his state of innocence like uh, like soil and uh, he's able to receive any seed right welcomed the hostile and the greedy counselor and by having touched that tree transgressed the command and disobeyed God. As a consequence, he was cast out into this world as a condemned man is cast into prison. That's it, guys. Our world, don't get comfortable. It's a prison, all right? And we have been set free. And when he had fathered many children and had grown very old and had returned to the earth through having tasted of the tree, an inheritance was left behind him for his children. Indeed, he left his children an inheritance not of chastity, but of unchastity, not of immortality, but of corruptibility, not of honor, but of dishonor, not of freedom, but of slavery, not of sovereignty, but of tyranny, not of life, but of death, not of salvation, but of destruction. Wow, serious stuff. But that's the description of our world, guys. This is our world. Any, any country you can travel to, there are cemeteries there, right? Everybody dies. Extraordinary and terrifying indeed was the destruction of men upon the earth. For the following things happened to them. They were carried off as slaves by sin, the tyrant, and were led away into the regions of desire, where they were totally engulfed by insatiable sensual pleasures, by adultery, by unchastity, by debauchery, by inordinate desires, by avarice, by murders, by bloodshed, by the tyranny of wickedness, by the tyranny of lawlessness. It's almost as if uh, Melito is reading today's newspaper headlines. For even a father of his own accord lifted up a dagger against his son, and a son used his hands against his father, and the impious person smote the breasts that nourished him, and brother murdered brother, and host wronged his guest, and friend assassinated friend, and one man cut throat of another with his tyrann tyrannous right hand. Therefore all men of the earth became either murderers or parasites, uh, sides or killers of their children. And yet a thing still more dreadful and extraordinary was to be found. A mother attacked the flesh which she gave birth to. A mother attacked those whom her breast had nourished. Wow, this is pretty coming close to the, you know, recent uh, debates over abortion and stuff like that. And she buried in her belly the fruit of her belly. Indeed, the ill-starred mother became a dreadful tomb when she devoured the child which she bore in her womb. 
Now, I should stop here and just kind of uh, comment on this because Melito is probably alluding to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. What happened there was the Roman armies besieged the city and there was such a famine in the city prior to its destruction that uh, there were reports of mothers actually eating their own children uh, because of there was there was such famine in in that city before Rome completely destroyed the city. So it, he may be alluding to that. Yeah, it's it's found in Eusebius if you're interested. The history of the church, an amazing book, where Eusebius uh, writes about these reports. But in addition to the to this, there were to be found among men many things still more monstrous. Monstrous. Ready? And terrifying and brutal. Father cohabits with his child, and son with his mother, and brother with sister, and male with male, and each man lusting after the wife of his neighbor. Because of these things sin exalted, which because it was death's collaborator entered first into the souls of men, and prepared as food for him the bodies of the dead. In every soul sin left its mark, and those in whom it placed its mark were destined to die. They were marked for death, right? And who of us can say we are without sin? None. Therefore, all flesh fell under the power of sin, and every body under the dominion of death. For every soul was driven out from its house of flesh. So he's referring to biological death, when your soul is driven out of the house of flesh, right? The separation of the body which dies and the soul. That's death. Indeed, that which had been taken from the earth was dissolved again into earth, and that which had been given from God was locked up in Hades. And that beautifully ordered arrangement was dissolved when the beautiful body was separated from the soul. So at the moment of death, the soul is separated from the body, and body returns to the elements of the earth. Yes, man was divided up into parts by death. Yes, an extraordinary misfortune and captivity enveloped him. He was dragged away captive under the shadow of death, and the image of the Father remained there desolate. For this reason, therefore, the mystery of the Passover has been completed in the body of the Lord. Indeed, the Lord's pre-arranged his own sufferings in the patriarchs and in the prophets. So he's going to talk about the prophecies. And in the whole people of God, giving his sanction to them through the law and the prophets. For that which was to exist in a new and grandiose fashion was pre-planned long in advance in order that when it should come into existence, one might attain to faith, just because it had been pre predicted long in advance. So indeed, also the suffering of the Lord predicted long in advance by means of types, but seen today as brought about faith, just because it had taken place as predicted. And yet men have taken it as something completely new. Well, the truth of the matter is the mystery of the Lord is both old and new, Old in so far as it involved the type, but new in so far as it concerns grace. And what is more, if you pay close attention to this type, you will see the real thing through its fulfillment. Accordingly, if you desire to see the mystery of the Lord, pay close attention to Abel. So he's, got, he's doing a survey of the Old Testament and how the types of Jesus were encoded in different events and prophecies. Abel, who likewise was put to death. Abel was a type of Jesus, right? Uh, Isaac, who likewise was bound hand and foot, to Joseph, who likewise was sold by Judah, right? Judah, his brother. Moses, who likewise was exposed, to David, who likewise was hunted down, to the prophets, who likewise suffered because they were the Lord's anointed. Pay close attention also to the one who was sacrificed as a sheep in the land of Egypt, to the one who smote Egypt and who saved Israel by his blood. For it was through the voice of prophecy that the mystery of the Lord was proclaimed. Moses indeed said to his people, Surely you will see your life suspended before your eyes, night and day, but you surely will not believe on your life. And David said, Why were the nations haughty and the people concerned about nothing? The kings of the earth presented themselves and the princes assembled themselves together against the Lord and against his anointed. 
he's quoting from Psalm 2, an amazing Psalm where it seems like there's a, there's a trinity because uh, th three different voices are conversing with one another. There seems to be like a narrator and as if a father and a son figure talking to one another. So uh, check out Psalm 2 for that if you're interested. And Jeremiah, I am an innocent lamb being led away to be sacrificed. They plotted evil against me and said, Come, let us throw him a tree for his food and let us exterminate him from the land of the living so that his name will never be recalled. That's from Jeremiah and from Isaiah, right? He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb is silent in the presence of the one who shears it. He did not open his mouth. Therefore, who will tell of his offspring? So basically this, uh, you know, this is fulfilled when Jesus does not open up, open his mouth when he's accused during the trial. And indeed, there were many other things proclaimed by numerous prophets concerning the mystery of the Passover, which is Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. When this one came from heaven to earth for the sake of the one who suffers and had clothed himself with that very one through the womb of a virgin and having come forth as a man, he accepted the sufferings of the sufferer through his body, which was capable of suffering. Right? Uh, Logos in, in heaven was not capable of suffering. He needed to take on humanity so that he was capable of suffering. And he destroyed those human sufferings by his spirit, which was incapable of dying. He killed death, which had put man to death. For this one, who was led away as a lamb and who was sacrificed as a sheep, by himself delivered us from servitude to the world, as from the land of Egypt, and released us from bondage to the devil, as from the hand of Pharaoh, and sealed our souls by his own spirit and the members of our bodies by his own blood. That's the good news, guys. That's amazing, isn't it? This is the one who covered death with shame and who plunged the devil into mourning, as Moses did Pharaoh. This is the one who smote lawlessness and deprived injustice of its offspring. As Moses deprived Egypt, this is the one who delivered us from slavery into freedom, from darkness into light, from death into life, from tyranny into an eternal kingdom, and who made us a new priesthood and a special people forever. This one is the Passover of our salvation. This is the one who patiently endured many things in many people. This is the one who was murdered in Abel and bound as a sacrifice in Isaac and exiled in Jacob, and sold in Joseph, and exposed in Moses, and sacrificed in the Lamb, and hunted down in David, and dishonored in the prophets. So Jesus was encoded. He was in, in, uh, in one way, in one aspect. He was in those men uh, that we read, on, uh, we read about in the Old Testament. Of course, he was not in them, but uh, he is there in type. This is the one who became human in a virgin, who was hanged on the tree, who was buried in the earth, who was resurrected from among the dead, who was raised ma mankind, who raised mankind up of the, out of the grave below to the heights of heaven. This is the lamb that was slain. This is the lamb that was silent. This is the one who was born of Mary, that beautiful you lamb. This is the one who was taken from the flock and was dragged to sacrifice and was killed in the evening and was buried at night and one who was not broken while on the tree, who did not see dissolution while in the earth, who rose up from the dead and who raised up mankind from the grave below. This one was murdered. And where was he murdered? Good question. In the very center of Jerusalem. Why? Because he had healed their lame and had cleansed their lepers and had guided their blind with light? and had raised up their dead? For this reason he suffered, somewhere it has been written in the law and the prophets. They paid me back evil for good, and my soul with barrenness, plotting evil against me, saying, let us bind this just man, because he's troublesome to us. That's from Isaiah. Why, O Israel, did you do this strange injustice? You dishonored the one who had honored you. You had held in contempt the one who held you in esteem. You denied the one who publicly acknowledged you. You renounced the one who proclaimed you his own. You killed the one who made you to live. 
Why did you do this, O Israel? Has it not been written for your benefit? Do not shed innocent blood, lest you die a terrible death. Nevertheless, Israel admits, I killed the Lord. Why? Because it was necessary for him to die. You have deceived yourself, O Israel, rationalizing thus about the death of the Lord. So what he's saying is that Israel is saying that, um, you know, in, in, he's talking about the, the Jewish leaders. They're saying he needed to die because he blasphemed. But he's saying, oh, you are rationalizing this uh, wrongly, he says. It was necessary for him to suffer. Yes, that is true. But not by you. Of all people, it was Israel who instigated his death. How ironic is that? It was necessary for him to be dishonored. Yes, but not by you. It was necessary for him to be judged. But not by you. It was necessary for him to be crucified. But not by you, nor by your right hand. O oh, Israel, you ought to have cried aloud to God with this voice. O oh, Lord, it, if it was necessary for your son to suffer, and if this was your will, let him suffer indeed, but not at my hands. Let him suffer at the hands of strangers. Let him be judged by the uncircumcised. Let him be crucified by the tyrannical right hand, but not by mine. But you, O oh Israel, did not cry out to God with this voice, nor did you absolve yourself of guilt before the Lord, nor were you persuaded by his works. The withered hand, which was restored whole to its body, did not persuade you, nor did the eyes of the blind, which were opened by his hand, nor did the paralyzed bodies restored to health again through his voice, nor did that most extraordinary miracle persuade you, namely the dead man raised to life from the tomb, where already he had been lying for four days. Obviously, he's talking about Lazarus, right? Even that did not convince the Jewish leaders. Indeed, dismissing these things, you, to your detriment, prepared the following for the sacrifice of the Lord at eventide. Sharp nails and false witnesses and fetters and scourges and vinegar and gall and a sword and an affliction and all as though it were for a blood-stained robber. For you brought to him scourges for his body and the thorns for his head. And you bound those beautiful hands of his which had formed you from the earth. And that beautiful mouth of his which had nourished you with life. You filled with gall. And you killed your Lord at the time of the great feast. Surely you were filled with gaiety, but he was filled with hunger. You drank wine and ate bread, but he vinegar and gall. You were a happy smile, but he had a sad countenance. You were full of joy, but he was full of trouble. You sang songs, but he was judged. You issued the command, he was crucified. You danced, he was buried. You lay down on a soft bed, but he in a tomb and coffin. So obviously, as Jesus died on the Passover, <clears throat> you know, the Jewish families and the Jewish rulers, especially the leaders, responsible for this would be celebrating, of course, and that's the contrast here. O oh, lawless Israel, why did you commit this extraordinary crime of casting your Lord into new sufferings, your master, the one who formed you, the one who made you, the one who honored you, the one who called you Israel? But you were found not really to be Israel, for you did not see God, you did not recognize the Lord, you did not know, O oh Israel, that this one was the firstborn of God. The one who was begotten before the morning star, the one who caused the light to shine forth, the one who made bright the day, the one who parted the darkness, the one who established the primordial starting point, the one who suspended the earth, the one who quenched the abyss, the one who stretched out the firmament, the one who formed the universe, the one who set in motion the stars of heaven, the one who caused those luminaries to shine, the one who made the angels in heaven, the one who established their thrones in that place, the one who by himself fashioned man upon the earth. This was the one who chose you. This was the one who guided you from Adam to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob and the 12 patriarchs. This was the one who, quite, who guided you into Egypt. Notice what Melito is saying. Look at their understanding of scriptures. He understands that it was Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Logos himself, 
that was present with Israel and guiding them through the Red Sea and so on. This is just amazing stuff, guys. I think in many churches, Christians today don't even have that understanding today, right? This was the one who lighted your root with a column of fire and provided shade for you by means of a cloud, and the one who divided the Red Sea and led you across it and scattered your enemy abroad. This is the one who provided you with manna from heaven and the one who gave you water to drink from a rock and the one who established your laws in Horeb, the one who gave you an inheritance in the land, the one who sent out his prophets to you, the one who raised up your kings. This is the one who came to you, the one who healed your suffering ones and who resurrected your dead. This is the one whom you sinned against. This is the one whom you wronged. This is the one whom you killed. This is the one whom you sold for silver, although you asked him for the didrachma. Yeah, because of paying taxes, right? Well, <clears throat> O ungrateful Israel, come here and be judged before me for your ingratitude. Now, how high a price did you place on being created by him? How high a price did you place on the discovery of your fathers? Basically, he's saying, you know, let's, let's set an amount. How much did you, uh, did you think it was worth, right? His protection, his, his love and care. How high a price did you place on the descent into Egypt and the provision made you for you there through the noble Joseph, right? During the famine, the family of Jacob found, uh, found uh, security in Egypt and they thrived there. How high a price did you place on the ten plagues? How high a price did you place on the nightly column of fire and the daily cloud and the crossing of the Red Sea? Notice he's equating all these events with Jesus. It was Jesus himself that was guiding, protecting Israel and setting them free. How high a price did you place on the gift of manna from heaven and the gift of water from the rock and the gift of law in Horeb and the land as an inheritance and the benefits accorded you there? How high a price did you place on your suffering people uh, whom he healed when he was present? Set me a price on the withered hand, which he restored whole to its body. Put me a price on the man born blind, whom he led into light by his voice. Put me a price on those who lay dead, whom he raised up alive from the tomb. Inestimable are the benefits that you came to from him, but you shamefully have paid him back with ingratitude, returning to him evil for good, and affliction for favor, and death for life. A person for whom you should have died. You should have died. Furthermore, if the king of some nation is captured by an enemy, a war is started because of him. Fortifications are shattered because of him. Cities are plundered because of him. Ransom is sent because of him. Ambassadors are commissioned because of him in order that he might be surrendered so that either he might be returned if living or that he might be buried if dead. Nice, interesting analogy, right? In, even in our human fallen world, if some great leader uh, is captured, then the country tries to bargain for that person to get them back alive. Um, right? Interesting analogy here. But you, quite to the contrary, voted against your Lord. Voted, which means chose Barabbas, which was uh, actually a murderer and a thief. Right? against your Lord, whom indeed the nations worshipped, and the uncircumcised admired, and the foreigners glorified, over whom Pilate washed, even Pilate himself washed his hands. He says, not my fault, I see no fault in this man. But as for you, you killed this one at the time of the great feast. The irony of ironies. Therefore, the feast of unleavened bread has become bitter to you, just as it was written, you will eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Bitter to you are the nails which you made pointed. Bitter to you is the tongue which you sharpened. Bitter to you are the false witnesses whom you brought forward. Bitter to you are the fetters which you prepared. Bitter to you are the scourges which you wo wo wove. Bitter to you is Judas whom you furnished with pay. Bitter to you is Herod whom you followed. Bitter to you is Caiaphas whom you obeyed. Bitter to you is the gall which you made ready. Bitter to you is the vinegar which you produced. 
bitter to you are the thorns which you plucked. The thorns that Jesus wore on his, uh, his the, the crown of thorns. Bitter to you are your hands which you bloodied when you killed your Lord in the midst of Jerusalem. Wow. These are some direct words, right? Very interesting. Pay attention, all families. Now he's appealing to the Gentiles, to you, to everyone, to all of us. Pay attention, all families of the nations, and observe. An extraordinary murder has taken place in the center of Jerusalem, in the city devoted to God's law, in the city of the Hebrews, in the city of the prophets, in the city thought of as just. And who has been murdered? And who is the murderer? I am ashamed to give the answer, but give it I must. For if this murder had taken place at night, or if he had been slain in a desert place, it would be well to keep silent. But it was in the middle of the main street, even in the center of the city, while all were looking on, that the unjust mar murder of this just person took place. And thus he was lifted up upon the tree, and an inscription was affixed identifying the one who had been murdered. Who was he? It is painful to tell, but it is more dreadful not to tell. Therefore hear and tremble because of him for whom the earth trembled. The one who hung on the earth, who, who hung the earth in space, is himself hanged. The one who fixed the heavens in place is himself impaled. Impaled, uh, maybe the word means he's attached to, um, to the wood, right? To the wood, uh, with nails. The one who firmly fixed all things is himself firmly fixed to the tree. The Lord is insulted. God has been murdered. The king of Israel has been destroyed by the right hand of Israel. O oh, frightful murder, O oh, unheard of injustice. The Lord is disfigured and he is not deemed worthy of a cloak for his naked body so that he might not be, not be seen exposed. The point is here that Jesus was crucified naked, right? So that they didn't even cover his body as he was hanging on the cross. For this reason, the stars turned and fled, and the day grew quite dark in order to hide the naked person hanging on the tree, darkening not the body of the Lord, but the eyes of man. Beautiful, eloquent language, right? The eyes of men are darkened. The sky is dark. Uh, the sky is actually uh, hiding Jesus' shame from the eyes of men. Very interesting. Yes, even though the people did not tremble, the earth trembled instead. Although the people were not afraid, the heavens grew frightened. Although the people did not tear their garments, the angels tore theirs. Although the people did not lament, the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. So uh, uh, when we talk about tearing the garment, okay, it's a sign of, of mourning, grief. And speaking of tearing, of course, at the moment of Jesus' death, you know, the, the, the curtain in the temple was torn top to bottom. God was signifying that now the access to God was open to all uh, because of Christ's death. Why was it like this, O Israel? You did not tremble for the Lord. You did not fear for the Lord. You did not lament for the Lord. Yet you lamented for your firstborn. You did not tear your garments at the crucifixion of the Lord, yet you tore your garments for your own who were murdered. You forsook the Lord, you were not found by him. You dashed the Lord to the ground. You too were dashed to the ground and lie quite dead. And I think he's talking from the perspective of in that history, from the recent um, destruction of Jerusalem, which was really terrible. I mean, um, yes, uh, Israel was scattered, right? And the whole city was destroyed. Everyone in that city perished because of the siege and then the subsequent uh, destruction. But he arose from the dead and mounted up to the heights of heaven. When the Lord had clothed himself with humanity and had suffered for the sake of the sufferer and had been bound for the sake of the imprisoned and had been judged for the sake of the condemned and buried for the sake of the one who was buried. He rose up from the dead and cried aloud with his, with his voice, Who is he who contends with me? Let him stand in opposition to me. I set the condemned man free. I gave the dead man life. I raised up the one who had been entombed. 
So the victory, Christ's victory, right? Who is my opponent? I. He says, I am the Christ. I am the one who destroyed death and triumphant, triumphed over the enemy and trampled Hades underfoot and bound the strong one and carried off man to the heights of heaven. I, he says, am the Christ. Therefore come, O families of men, you who have been befouled with sins and receive forgiveness for your sins. Notice, receive. It's a free gift. I am your forgiveness. I am the Passover of your salvation. I am the lamb which was sacrificed for you. I am your ransom. I am your light. I am your savior. I am your resurrection. I am your king. I am leading you up to the heights of heaven. I will show you the eternal father. I will raise you up by my right hand. This is the one who made the heavens and the earth and who in the beginning created man who was proclaimed through the law and prophets who became human via the virgin who was hanged upon a tree who was buried in the earth and who was resurrected from the dead and who ascended to the heights of heaven who sits at the right hand of the father who has authority to judge and to save everything through whom the father created everything from the beginning of the world to the end of the age this is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the beginning and the end. An indescribable beginning and an incomprehensible end. This is the Christ. This is the King. This is Jesus. This is the General. This is the Lord. This is the one who rose up from the dead. This is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. He bears the Father and is born by the Father. To whom be the glory and the power forever. Amen. Yes, second century, guys. Can you believe this? Melita of Sardis. Peace to the one who wrote, to the one who reads, and to the one, those who love the Lord in simplicity of heart. Well, guys, I don't know if you are blown away by this. I, I'm, oh, I, I've read this several times now, and I'm always blown away by uh, the understanding that the early Christians had of what the Passover is all about. And I know it's a little bit long, so just imagine the eloquence of these people is just mind-blowing. Um, yeah, we're grateful for to have this, this homily, um, one of the writings of, of Melito of Sardis. So I hope that by this time you have a better understanding of what Passover is, Passover is how Jesus fits the fulfillment of the Passover. Um, I'm not telling you to celebrate the Passover. I'm not going to tell you how you should celebrate it but uh, we know that um, Jesus is our Passover right and uh, regard regardless of how many times you you break the bread or you drink of the wine and and the bread remembering Jesus whether you do it on the 14th of Nisan whether you do it while celebrating Easter or any other time it doesn't matter none of this matters what matters is that we are his and he is our Lord. And, and yet, through this mystery of the Passover that we've just studied, we can have a greater understanding of, of this amazing thing that Jesus did for us. And we can appreciate it. And I hope that we can also, through the better understanding of these things, we can also be witnesses to our Jewish uh, friends so that they too may have a chance to uh, look back, reflect on these things, and if any of them believe, be included uh, in the provisions of the new covenant. Well, everyone, I really appreciate, I really appreciate uh, you staying until the end. And if you're watching this until the end, please type in the comments, amen, if you agree with what Melito was telling us. Uh, this way I'll know. <laughs> Well, I don't need to know, but it seems like YouTube likes comments. So please leave a comment and, uh, and I just hope to see you next time. Before we part though, let's just thank God for this amazing, uh, for, the, well, for this teaching that we got it here through the time machine from second century. Father God, we thank you so much. Thank you for Jesus, who is the fulfillment of, of, of Passover. He's our Passover lamb. Father, thank you that just as you have um, led Israel out of Egypt through Jesus and his blood, we are led out of the slavery of sin into the newness of life. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too are raised to eternal life. 
awaiting the uh, redemption of our bodies, to see you face to face, to be where you are forever. Father, as we reflect on these things, as the Passover is coming up on the calendar and as, the, as Easter is coming up very soon too, Father, may these things, may we, as we contemplate these things, may your spirit transform us from within to be more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Be blessed. Uh, remember to hit that bell icon for notifications for upcoming streams and teachings. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Be blessed. Bye for now.